How's it going everybody? We are finally off and running here. Uh, welcome to the brand new On Deck Circle podcast uh, powered by FantasySixPack.net. Uh, you probably should know now uh, that I'm your host Dave Eddy. You can find me at Twitter uh, at Corporal Eddy. Uh, this podcast is meant to go along with my very popular dynasty rankings uh, that are put out on FantasySixPack.net. And which you will find updated every other Sunday. Now, in between those weeks of rankings uh, that I update, I'm going to be dropping this podcast uh, to discuss those rankings and answer some of the questions that I get in regards to them. So if you have any questions about the rankings, drop me a comment on the article uh, on Twitter or on Reddit or wherever else you run into them at. And I'm probably going to have a guest from time to time, but most likely I'm going to be doing this podcast solo. So if you're like my ex-wife and hate my voice, then this is definitely not going to be the podcast for you guys, all right? So without any further ado, uh, let's kind of get to it. Um, My rankings currently are sitting at just a little bit over 600. I had started them at... 700 plus but we had a little snafu with the website that we use so so long story short where we're sitting at a little bit over 600 um now whenever i do the rankings i think i look at things you know maybe with a little bit of a different eye than, than some people do you know I'm, I'm definitely looking you know for dynasty rankings um to me we're looking at a five to eight year window so sometimes when you see things um you know that that's information that that will be helpful for you to to kind of wrap your head around maybe why you know young guys maybe are a little bit higher than than what you would think because you know again I'm not looking at you know a single season here I'm not looking at two or three years even I'm looking somewhere you know five to eight years and if you read the intro to the article um, you know th- that's detailed in there um, as well as some other information just kind of about you know the strategy that I use. Um, when I'm building, um, you know, these teams and, and then as they're continuing, um, you know, from year to year, uh, another thing that will distinguish me from others is I definitely, um, have hitting Trump pitching. So I am, I'm very scared of arms, um, very scared of young arms, especially. And when I say young arms, I'm talking about, um, you know, guys that are, you know, at least a couple of years away from the majors. So, I'm not talking about a young guy like maybe a Walker Bueller. Um, you know, I'm talking about a guy like maybe Alex Manoa or, you know, um, somebody that's, you know, much further along um, like that. So um, with all that being said, let's kind of um, break into it a little bit. I, I thought that for the first episode um, here as I, you know, get into the first rankings of the 2020 season, that would make sense to kind of hit on you know position by position um discuss the top 10 basically um you know and just kind of explain a little bit of my logic i'm not going to hit every guy but um i think it's it's good to to go through them and so with that being said uh let's go ahead and start with the catching position uh catching position and relief pitchers are, are two things that i'm not very big on so don't expect you know some big long rants here but um i do got gary sanchez as number one I mean, pretty much, uh, you know, I think between him and Rio Muto, um, you have a very clear cut one and two. But I think that Gary Sanchez is going to provide you with, you know, the upside in a in a dynasty league that you're looking for. And so I've got him above Rio Muto. But again, um, you know, Rio Muto is a very, very clear number two. Um, very consistent. I mean, if, if you were to half minor team you don't really have to worry too much about the catching position and kind of after that it's it's a crapshoot in my opinion uh just to run down the rankings um for anyone who's who's watching this on youtube um you'll see my slides but for those of you on itunes and spotify and stitcher and and wherever else you're listening um obviously you're not going to see that but um i've got wilson Contreras at number three um of the cubs good young catcher uh, I think if you know, even if you have him, I think you're you're looking very strong. I've got Yasmani Grandal at four. 
um, big prospect um, popping up. Well, actually, back-to-back prospects. Uh, Adley Rushman, uh, last year's number one pick in the draft. I think that he's a kid who is going to be absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not big on catchers, but uh, Rushman's a guy that. You know, I don't know that I would necessarily pay up for, but in a first-year player draft, um, you know, I'm not going to take him as high as most, again, because he's a catcher, but I'd be hard-pressed to let him fall out of the top five, and I I don't think that in any first-year player draft he's going to fall that low. Uh, Right behind him, Joey Bart. um, Should be a very solid Buster Posey-like um, replacement here very soon. Number seven, Will Smith, who who had a gr- pretty good, well, I'd say maybe even had a great 2019. Um, kind of came out of nowhere just a little bit, but very young catcher. Um, you know, has, has got a lot of upside. I think part of his downfall could simply be that the Dodgers are loaded with catching prospects. So um, they've got Ruiz back there. They got Cartea as well. Both of which, at least Cartea for sure, I think have a much higher upside than Will Smith. So um, that could definitely derail him a little bit. Number eight is is Salvador Perez, a guy who missed all of 2019. Um, Of course, I'm almost positive that the reason he missed all of 2019 was uh, because in the TGFBI, I, for the first time in my life, decided to reach a little bit for a catcher. And in the fifth round, I drafted Salvador Perez. So... Of course, I get rewarded by him missing, you know, the entire season. Uh, eight actually may be a little bit low on him. I, I think I might have to revisit this a little bit because the more I've, I've dug into things, the more I've liked Salvador Perez, and he's been so consistent other than, you know, the year that he lost last year. So um, I'm going to have to revisit that, and, and we'll see what the next set of rankings if, if I don't change that up a little bit. Uh, number nine, Sean Murphy. Good young catcher, um, got his first taste of the big leagues last year. Um, I think he, he definitely has a lot of potential. And then a guy that I'm probably lower on than most, talked about this on Fantasy Six Pack Hour when we were previewing the catcher position, um, Mitch Garver. I've got down at number 10. I think a lot of people would put him higher, but I just haven't seen a big enough sample size for um, him to believe that what he did last year is real. So I'm a little bit on the lower side there. Uh, moving to first base position, uh, kind of a position that in the past has been a lot deeper, I think, than it is right now. Um, I mean, still 10 good names on, on that list we're going to kind of go through real quick. But um, it's it's more top-heavy, I think, than, than it had been in the past where it was, it was a deeper position. Um, Cody Bellinger, clear number one here. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure how you could argue otherwise. Uh, I mean, power numbers, you know, he's right there. Um, He's the only guy at this position that's going to get you double-digit steals. Now, granted, it's not like he's going to steal you a ton of bases, but, you know, he squeaks you out 10 to 15. That really does make a difference uh, between him and the number two, who I've got is Freddie Freeman. Uh, Freddie Freeman is consistent as it gets. Uh, You know exactly what you're going to get from him. And, I mean, let's be honest, in, in fantasy, that's extremely important. Uh, Number three, I've got Pete Alonzo. Um, Maybe a little bit high on him at this point, and that's not so much a a knock on him. His his rookie season 2019 was just absolutely ridiculous. And I don't think that he's going to repeat that in 2020. Now, again, we're looking, you know, five to eight years in advance, so I wouldn't, you know, even worry so much if, you know, he has the inevitable, you know, sophomore slump in 2020 but I mean to be honest um, the guy that I have at number four Matt Olson um, he's he's the exact same age as Pete Alonzo but he's had three years of putting up good numbers and each of those years they've gotten a little bit better and again this is another case of the more that I look into things the more that I'm questioning my myself on my ranking so I may well pop Olson up ahead of Pete Alonzo but we'll see um, it, it, it's, it's tough. I, I think you could easily argue both ways. Um, but that's where they sit right now. Uh, to round out the rest of the top 10, I got my boy Jose Abreu, uh, coming at number five, getting up there in age. He's up to 33 now, but very solid contributor. Again, you know exactly what you're going to get. Anthony Rizzo at number six, uh, 30 years of age, uh, plays for a pretty good team. Again, fairly consistent guy. Number seven, I got Paul Goldsmith. Uh, 
is kind of hitting the very end of his prime. I think we, we probably have seen the best of him. Uh, he no longer you know, steals bags for you anymore, which, again, can be a big difference maker at a position like first base. But I don't think that Goldie is a guy that you can count out by any means. You're probably looking at a, another you know, 30 home run, 100 RBI season. Uh, may well get you uh, 100 runs or, or damn close to it. I, I think that's extremely valuable. Uh, I think that he's he's very underrated. Uh, number eight, I'm going to throw DJ LeMahieu in there. Not as high on him, I think, as most people are. Um, I, I just need to see more out of him. I know last year he was you know, an MVP candidate for a while, um, but he slides in here at number eight. Uh, number nine, I got Reese Hoskins. Uh, shout out to my boy Reese White if he's listening to this. Um, I, I like Reese Hoskins. Um, not the most consistent player, however. Very... Very high uh, upside still, uh, 26 years of age, so just now get to entering his prime. And then a guy that I'm probably a little lower on than most is Josh Bell. Uh, I think kind of the theme that you might get from me here is consistency. I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of inconsistency whatsoever, so that definitely plays a role when we start talking about you know a guy like Josh Bell, who even though you know he ended the season with great numbers, very streaky, very much up and down kind of player. Um, and I know in a dynasty, you know, streaks aren't so important necessarily, but, um, you know, not exactly the uh, elite guy um, as far as first basemen are concerned in, in my eyes. And then we move to second base. Um, I mean, I, I think Glaber Torres is number one there. Um, I'm definitely a huge fan of the second base list. Uh, this kind of has to be the top guy right now. I think it's very, very likely he leads all second basemen in home runs and RBIs. And he's only 23 years of age. So, I mean, you're getting him while he's young. He's putting up elite numbers already. So he's your top choice. Uh, I've got Jose Altuve slotting in at number two. i got to be honest with you. Um, Consider the Houston Astros scandal when ranking the, the players this offseason. But I didn't really give Altuve too much of a dip. I think he's a fantastic, absolutely great hitter. Um, and I think in his game, he should be fine. Uh, I've got Keston Hirara at number three, which is probably a lot higher. or Maybe not a lot higher, but definitely higher than I think most people have him. But this kid is absolutely incredible. Uh, would not surprise me at all if he went for... Uh, 30 home runs, 100 RBIs, scored 100 runs this year, and he's going to get you double digit and steals as well. He's going to throw a respectable average in there. Again, 23, same as Glaber. Um, I'm a big Huehara fan, so I've got him sliding in at number three. It's actually kind of close to putting him over Altuve. I think I kind of let the Astros scandal maybe weigh a little too heavy in my mind. I just wasn't able to to pull the trigger there. Um, if you see the graphics on the screen here, it still has Yoan Mankata in at second base rankings. Um, where we do the rankings, he is eligible at second base. I think in most of your leagues, he's not going to be. Um, so we'll kind of just skip over him for now. We'll talk about him next at, at third base. Um, but to round out the rest of the list, I got Ozzy Albies in at number five. Very good young player again. Um, it tends to be very, I wouldn't even say streaky because he goes in long stretches. Uh, but age 23, a lot of upside there. Uh, Whit Merrifield I got coming in next. He's actually going to be moving to the outfield, so this will be your last year to to get him in at second base. Uh, but at age 31, he has been a, a good overall player. Uh, has a nice all-around game, very, very good for Roto especially. Um, so if you're into Roto uh, and you're playing Dynasty, then you may be in our on-deck circle fantasy league. Uh, the dynasty league that we got going on right now, I think we're 55 rounds through our 100 man, uh, draft. We got 14 teams. So we're looking at 1400 players. Um, check me out on Twitter for a little bit more information on, on how that goes, but very excited to get that league off and running. And number seven, I got, uh, Gavin Lux, uh, again, 22 years of age. Uh, I think, uh, you're going to see here for me, age is, is a big part of this. Um, should be for you as well. A hell of a good young player. Uh, Dodgers refused to trade him uh, for Mookie Betts, so I think that should tell you what they think of him. Uh, Kevin Biggio comes in next. Uh, personally, I'm a, I'm a huge Blue Jays fan, apparently. I did not realize that until I started to look at how much good young talent they have and good young talent that I personally really like. 
Uh, I would love to have put him higher on this list, but I'm, I'm just not sure who I could put him ahead of. But uh, I've got Vigio sliding in kind of right near the end of the top top 10 there. Uh, again, DJ LeMahieu slides into this at 9. Uh, number 10, I got Jonathan Villar, a guy that the Marlins got for absolutely nothing because the Baltimore Orioles don't know how to run a baseball team. So, again, weird, weird situation how they, they let their best player just, just go for nothing. I, I guess I get it to some extent, but it just doesn't make sense. But um, Marlins, you know, picked up a, a really good player. Um, I think he has a ton of value real life uh, and in fantasy. So would be happy to have him um, play in my infield. We move to third base ranks. Third base is a fun position in baseball right now. There are just so many stars that are playing the hot corner right now. And I've got Rafael Devers um, heading the list going into 2020. Dude's a total stud. Should have no problem this year putting up 30 home runs, 100 RBI, scoring 100 runs, and he might even hit 300. Um, just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and again, another young kid, 23 years of age, and, and he's doing these things. It's, it's just ridiculous. Probably my... Favorite player in baseball right now. Um, I've got sliding in number two right behind Devers. Um, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Absolutely helium sky high on Vlad. I truly think he is going to be Cooperstown bound when, when this is all said and done. Um, absolutely, like I said, sky high on, on this kid's bat. Um, great makeup. Great bloodlines. Great ball player. Uh, wasn't you know so good. Uh, didn't meet expectations in, in his taste of you know Pro Bowl 2019, but if you're sleeping on this kid, you are you are missing the boat. Um, if you have any opportunity whatsoever to buy low on him at all, the guy's 20 years of old, 20 years of age. Um, so good he can't even fucking talk. Um, I, Vlad Jr. is a guy that I would love to put number one at this list. Um, even I can't quite justify it with how good Devers has been. Uh, number three might be a surprise to some people. I've got um, Jose Ramirez. Uh, he sure did struggle a lot in 2019, but at the end of the year, his numbers were still pretty respectable. Again, another guy has a chance to go 30 home runs, 100 RBIs, 100 runs, hit 300. He also has a chance he's going to steal you 20-plus bags. I cannot tell you how valuable that is to, to be able to get those powered numbers, that batting average, and those stolen bases. At number, I mean, those numbers at, at number three at a position are, are ridiculous. Um, that's how much I like Jose Ramirez. And he's only 27, which is right in the middle of his prime. So to, to think that he's going to uh, to regress or think that, you know, 2019 was, was more than injuries, I, I think you would be, I think you'd be wrong there. Um, absolutely MVP caliber talent um, for J-Ram. The biggest question I, I've got on my ranking so far has been about Alex Bregman, who doesn't he doesn't slide in next. Um, he actually slides in a little bit further down, um, but I, I want to address it real quick. I've got uh, Arenado coming in at four. I've got Anthony Rendon coming in at five, and then Bregman slides in at six. And uh, I mean, for me, I dropped him because of that scandal. Again, we've talked about it with Altuve. Um, that that's the reason that that I dropped him. Um, in retrospect, I, I definitely dropped him a little bit too far. Um, when I went back and you know did the research I should have probably more so done at the beginning um, and looked at his splits, I come to find that his splits were not nearly what I thought they were going to be. Um, and he was actually better on the road than he was at home. So, so shame on me. Um, Alex Bergman is going to jump up these rankings. I don't know exactly where. Um, but he's going to. Uh, that's a miscalculation on my part. Now, it's going to be one of many that, that you know could, could be on this list. Maybe not not so big. Um, but when you're talking 600 plus players, um, you know you're definitely going to have some some spots where you're different with with people. Sometimes right, sometimes wrong. A lot of times, especially when you get towards the middle, the 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 last third of the list. I mean, you could jump guys. 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 spots sometimes and, and be completely justified. So um, it's one of the reasons that not a lot of people have the guts to produce this kind of list that I do for you guys and go 600 deep. Um, so I hope that you take that into consideration and, and just remember that whenever you know we've got some, some discrepancies between our lists, 
so moving on here, we go to the shortstop ranks. Man, I got to tell you, this, this is the the hardest but yet the most fun position to rank. I think it is just littered with MVP talent all the way through um, the entire top 10. Uh, right now, however, I'm throwing Fernando Tatis Jr. again with those bloodlines uh, right at the top of this list. It's crazy to think that at age 21, the season that he was putting together before he got hurt um, last season. If he had played out the entire season, he was pacing for 40 home runs, driving in 100 runs, hitting well over 300, and swiping you 30-plus bags. Just ridiculous numbers. Uh, and, and why would you think that you know, at, at that age that he shouldn't get better? So top shortstop um, right now that I want on my team moving forward for the next you know decade. Uh, the rest of the list, I mean, it's it's just superstar after superstar, in my opinion. Um, you know, you, you could, you know, move these guys, shuffle them around a little bit, and I don't think you can necessarily be wrong. Um, I got Frankie Lindor coming in at number two. Trevor Story coming right behind him at number three. We talked about Glaber Torres already, got him at four. Trey Turner I got at five. Again, you could put Trey Turner all the way up to number two, and I don't, I, I you know, you could, you might get some sideways looks, but I think you could argue it. Um, Bregman, who has some shortstop eligibility, um, got him sliding in at seven. His teammate Carlos Correa sliding in at eight. Probably surprised uh, a lot of people there that I, I am higher on Correa than most. I absolutely think again MVP talent player um, sliding him in at, in at eight, even though he's had his struggles. Number nine, we go back to my Blue Jays. I got Bo Bichette, who just lit the world on fire when when he got called up last year. Um, I think he shattered most people's expectations. I uh, saw a lot of Vlad and Bo Bichette uh, playing here in Lansing for the Lugnuts. So um, while I didn't expect him to just do what he did in 2019, I don't think I was as surprised as as most people. I was actually more surprised at, at Vlad struggling than I was with you know the hot start that Bichette has came off of. And then number 10, um, we get to Wander Franco. This is a guy that I don't know how a lot of people will view him. Um, you could you could argue that ten at shortstop's a little bit low. And you could argue that ten at shortstop's you know very high, but it, it's it's difficult. But he's the number one prospect in the game, in my opinion, bar none. Um, I, I would throw him an eighty hit tool, which is ridiculous. The only other guy that in recent memory that that I would have said eighty hit tool for is Vlad. Um, mix in a sixty power tool for him. Uh, he can run just fine. He's got a 55 to 60 um, run tool. He's got a great arm, so he's you know not gonna not, not gonna hurt you on the field at all with that arm. And he's an average fielder as well. Uh, if there's any chance in the world that you're able to score Franco right now, I would get him. You might think that his price is high, but once he gets up to the show, uh, that price is only gonna go up from there. So if you can get, if you don't own one of those 10 guys try to get one um the, the shortstop position is just ridiculously high end all the way through the top 10 and then we move to the outfield position which naturally is going to be very deep um obviously teams are playing more outfielders than than they are other positions um so it's a very loaded very deep position but it's, it can be intriguing at the very very top um i'll be honest with you i i could make a very strong case um, for for three players to be number one, I think you know the obvious answer is is Mike Trout, and you wouldn't be wrong to put him at the top of the list. Um, I, I could go so far; I could argue Christian Yelich to be number one at this position, and I think statistically I could make a strong enough point that 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 I could stand on it. But at the end of the day, um, right now Ronald Acuna Jr. is my number one outfield um, player. And dynasty baseball, um, I think that it's it's really between Acuna um, and Trout. Though I again could argue between Acuna and Yelich as well, but um, right now it's between Acuna and Trout still. I think that between the two of them, they're going to be fairly close in most categories across the board in 2020. Uh, the exception between the two is Trout's going to hit about 20 points higher, you would think, than Acuna. But, but what really just kind of stacks the deck and puts Acuna on top for me is the fact that he's probably going to double the stolen bags of Trout, which, um, I mean, stolen bases these days are, are coming harder and harder to get by. 
And Acuna, six years younger than Trout. I think this is, you know, the time where, you know, Trout has kind of been dethroned. Now, I'm not saying that 2020, he won't necessarily, you know, have a better season. But, again, over the next five to eight years, you know, give me Acuna's, you know, age 20 years as opposed to, you know, getting into Trout's age 30 years. And then that's not a knock on Trout at all, as that's just how good Acuna is. And believe it or not, like I said, I, I, I think you could consider putting Yelich over Trout as well. Uh, arguments very close to the same between those two. Um, difference here is, you know, the stolen bases are, are highly in Yelich's favor. And I could even argue that he could overtake Trout in home runs. But, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, that Trout has the same chance to catch Yelich in stolen bases. However, you know, it's, it's, it's Michael fucking Trout. Um, you know, I'm going to have to see something more from Yelich and something less from Trout. Um, which I don't expect to see um, before I could move Trout down at another spot. He's an absolutely generational talent, um, and he has definitely earned his spot um, at this point. Um, and, you know, like I said, you could, you could argue that putting him at two is disrespecting him. Um, but it is possible to, to see him being overtaken for the second spot this year, but we'll have to see how things go. Um, so I, you know, I think that, I thought that at least I was going to get some grief for putting uh, Bellinger over Soto. Um, I, I haven't. Um, they're so similar statistically. And to me, the difference really just is that first base eligibility um, that Bellinger obviously has that Soto doesn't. And so so that's what makes me give him the nod there. Um, it's actually a much closer call for me between um, Soto and Betts. Kind of the uncertainty that, that Betts has got going on right now. Um, you know, even just to the fact of where is he going to play? Who's going to, you know, be protecting him in the lineup? Um, and then the fact that he's also five years older than Soto. Um, you know, I've got Soto ranked ahead of Betts. And then to round out the list, um, we got Bryce Harper. I don't think I need to say a whole lot more about him. Uh, Aaron Judge, who health is a concern for me with him. I could easily see him jumping up ahead of Bryce Harper, but um, I've got to see some some health out of him. Uh, Eloy Jimenez, I've got at nine, uh, probably a little bit of an aggressive ranking on him, but I, I think he is that good. I think that you're you're going to really see his potential start to start to come now that he's got you know a, a good chunk of big league time underneath his belt. And then sliding in at number ten, um, guy with some outfield eligibility, I've got Chris Bryant slide in there. You can make an argument for you know a handful of players. Um, but that's who's going to slide in there for me, uh, at least for, for right now. I think it'd be hard to you know make a strong case that someone 100% should be over Bryant at, at this point in time. And then very similar to the starting pitching, um, or very similar to the outfield we have starting pitching. Um, again, so many you know guys rostered that it makes a very deep position. But I think you'd be hard-pressed to say anyone but Garrett Cole is number one. Uh, right in the middle of his prime, age 29. Um, I mean, the season that he just came off of, the, the seasons he's just came off of, I think he's number one, simple as that. Now, the tough call for me is actually at number two, um, number three. Uh, and that's for me between Jacob deGrom and Walker Bueller. Now, Bueller is six years younger, so you know how that, that makes me feel. Um, and my, my heart really says Walker Bueller at number two. But we've just seen too much greatness uh, out of Jacob DeGrom recently to, to put anyone but him behind Cole right now. Uh, that could definitely change as the season goes on, but it's kind of hard-pressed not to put DeGrom at, at two, um, which obviously leaves Walker Bueller at number three. Uh, right behind him is a guy that I think is criminally underrated, um, and maybe because of that reason, I, I guess you could argue, some people will probably argue, um, that I'm too high on Shane Bieber, but again, age, 24 years old, um, if he can maintain these strikeout numbers, uh, I don't see the ERA and whip going anywhere, so um, I mean, Shane Bieber, I didn't, never thought I would have said that a year ago today, I've got him number four on the list, another guy I think I'm higher on than most, Jack Flaherty, um, 24 years old, again, um, another young guy, what scares me about him is his motion. Um, to me, makes him an injury risk. But literally, I couldn't name you a pitcher on the top 10 anywhere on my list that is not an injury risk to me. Uh, pitching is so volatile. Uh, 
it just scares me to death. So, like, like I said earlier, hitting Trump's pitching for me. So as much as I love these guys, you know, even Garrett Cole, I wouldn't touch in the first round of a fantasy draft. I just, I'm just not. I'm taking, I'm taking bats. I'm taking multiple bats. Uh, and you're not going to see me probably own a single guy on the top 10 list here of pitching, even though I, I love each and every one of them. And then after that, we kind of start to, you know, round out the rest of the top 10 with, with a little bit of older guys. Uh, Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, of course, um, former Tigers, which which pains me, but um, glad to have seen these, these guys win rings somewhere else. Wish it would have been in Detroit, but um you know these guys coming in 35 36 years of age so even though they are you know very advanced with with their age it's it's hard to ignore how well they've been pitching um so i'm I'm putting them as high as i am uh rounding out the the rest of it then we got steven strasberg coming in at number eight Uh, obviously just phenomenal uh, 2019 postseason as well number nine chris sale guy that again i I guess I say this with everybody, but injuries scare me. Um, when he is on, he is number one on this list, period. Uh, if he comes out and he completely dominates in 2020, puts up a normal Chris Sale-type season, I mean, the, the sky's the limit for him on this ranking. Um, Cole would have to do something to, to get knocked down, but you can see Chris Sale fly up this list. And then number 10, I got Mike Clevelinger. Again, 29 years of age, right in the middle of his prime. It's just absolutely fantastic pitcher. I think he's just criminally underrated again. Um, I, I just absolutely love Mike Clevelander. And then we get to, again, the next position that I'm not so high on, relief pitching. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get too in-depth here. Um, part of the reason that, that I'm not a big fan as well is it's so easy to get guys that have multiple eligibility. So I've got a guy like Julio Uris, um in at number four. Would imagine he's going to be a starter this year. Um, tough to say. One of my one of my favorites. Um, but I've got Josh Hader heading the list. I don't I don't think anyone would would disagree with that. Kirby Yates I've got in at number two. Absolutely phenomenal closer. Roberto Azuna coming in at number three. A lot of it is you know talent, but a lot of it's opportunity as well. Houston wins lots of games. Gets you a lot of those counting stats and saves. I uh, talked about Uris at four, Raldus Chapman at five. Very similar to Azuna at number three. Lots of chances uh, for saves, but also obviously a phenomenal pitcher. Um, Liam Hendricks slides in here at number six. That's kind of a new name for a lot of people. Um, so without getting you know too much into it, because again, we're talking about relief pitching. I don't really care too much about it. Um, look up Liam Hendricks and, and see why he's at number six. Edwin Diaz in at number seven. Again, if we're going by Dane value alone, you're surprised to see 25-year-old, at least formerly dominant closer this low, but something just isn't right about him. And again, it just speaks to the volatility of pitching that Edwin Diaz two years ago was hands down number one closer in baseball. Nothing to talk about. Uh, Eight, I got Kenley Jansen. Again, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity mixed in with skill. Um, Great pitcher, great opportunities. Uh, number nine, I have Alex Reyes. Could be a little bit of an aggressive um, push there, but when it comes to relief pitching, you know, you give me a guy who has ace potential but is in the bullpen because he can't stay healthy. Um, could be just ridiculously dominant in, in relief, and I think that's where you're going to see him. I think that's where you're going to see him a lot this year, maybe exclusively. It's tough to say him and Carlos Martinez are, are kind of similar, but Reyes has a higher upside for sure. And then I got Iglesias from Cincinnati, um, much improved team, um, very good closer there, uh, rounding out the top 10. And then we get to the overall top 10. So so this is difficult. Um, I mean, when, once you get to me past the top three, you could kind of slide these guys around and you'd have a hell of a time really having a strong argument against or, or for anything in particular. Um, obviously, I had taken Acuna over Trout um, at number one in the outfield. I've got Acuna number one overall. Um, slide Trout right in behind him, and then I slide Yelich right in behind there. So outfield, 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 one, two, three. I uh, got Cody Bellinger, who we talked about obviously earlier, number one first baseman. Also has that outfield eligibility. Very, very important to me. Um, the, you know, you get a guy that you can slide in at both. It may not always be 
super handy, but definitely, especially when you're drafting, you know, if you if you have the choice between these elite players and you can snag a guy like Bellinger that you could slide in at first base if you don't get a, a quality first baseman, you know, that you like early on, um, or if you you know somebody somebody drops and you can get a Pete Alonso in the third round, let's say, um, yeah, you slide Bellinger to the outfield. You know, that versatility is really valuable. Um, I got Juan Soto coming in at five. Maybe a little bit aggressive there, but I mean Juan Soto is one of the best young players in baseball. I I do think his game's a little bit more suited towards real life than fantasy. But I mean, if, if we're nitpicking Juan Soto at number five, uh, I mean I, I think that's I think that's pretty good still. Fernando Tatis Jr. I have signed at number six again. If he was healthy, the the season that he would have put up is just mind boggling. I, I could argue he could be as high as, you know, three or four on this list. But, again, you could drop him all the way down to ten, and it's hard to argue that the guys below him, you know, couldn't possibly be better. Um, another shortstop right behind him. Well, two shortstops right behind him. Uh, Lindor and Trevor Story. Great players. Absolutely MVP caliber players. Um, love them both. Would love to own either one of them. Number nine, Mookie Betts. Um Again, we talked about him. Even with a little bit of uncertainty, um, it's still Mookie friggin' Betts. Uh, dude is a five five tool player all day, all night. I don't care if he's playing in San Diego, Boston, Detroit, L.A. I mean, Mookie Betts is a top ten talent in baseball. Period. And then coming in at number ten, uh, Rafael Devers. Again, um, hard for me to put anybody over over Vlad at third base, but um, you know he there he is. So so that rounds out the top ten. Um, and that gives you a little bit of you know every position, a little bit about my thoughts about how I put it together. Um, if you like the Dynasty rankings, I, I hope that you've liked this podcast as well. Obviously, I think they, they go together very well. Uh, first episode is going to be a little bit different than the rest. The other episodes, we're going to have top riser and top faller for each week. Um, kind of just a lot of times it's just you know ranking corrections, just things that you know needed to be adjusted. Um, because with Dynasty, it's kind of hard for somebody just to, you know, have a crazy, crazy couple weeks and, and jump up a Dynasty board. It's not, it's not like a, a rest of the year kind of rankings. But, um, you know, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you listen to this on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe. You can get this every two weeks um, to go right along with those rankings that I'm sure you're double checking. And if you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere there, subscribe as well. Um, you know, every time this comes out. You know, we're looking at anywhere from half hour to an hour of, of straight up dynasty baseball talk um, from a guy that's putting out the deepest or one of the deepest lists that you're going to find. Um, so that being said, a lot of work goes into this. Um, if you go on the anchor page, you'll see a spot for donations as well. So if you feel so inclined to, you know, give your support that way, um, you know, I would appreciate that as well. Um, like I said, a lot of work goes into this and I know that a lot of people utilize and enjoy this tool. Um, so that'd be much appreciated. So, um, throw me questions, like I said, on Twitter, um, throw me questions on the article on fancy six pack.net. Uh, you'll find myself on Reddit as well. Um, you know, throw me questions. Give me, give me something that, that you want to hear about. You want to hear my thoughts. You want to hear my, my process. You want to hear the why, um, you know, happy to, to answer them. Not only there in that venue, but also on the podcast as well. So I hope that everyone has enjoyed this podcast. I know that I, uh, I'm, I'm excited to get this thing kicked off, and I'm excited to do this for you all. So with that being said, I will see you in two weeks.